now the system saying that broadcast is about to start to get started. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm glad that you're able to join us today. We have a nice um, discussion, hopefully, um, to show you um, and are joined by a couple of really um, great speakers. And um, we'll start with, um, let me start by opening the slideshow. Um, so the webinar, the topic for today is genomic translation for public health. Um, we'll hear first from Toby Citrin, who will um, do more in-depth introductions of our two speakers, Nguyen and Corey, the director of the National Office of Public Health Genomics, and Deb Duquette um, from the Michigan Department of Community Health. Um, and they, they'll speak for about a half an hour um, collectively, and then we'll hopefully be able to address your questions um, and figure out some next steps. The, today's webinar is being sponsored by the APHA Genomics Forum, um, the Genetic Alliance, and the Center for Public Health and Community Genomics. And Toby will talk more about each of those, those groups. Um, the genomics you know, so the, the topic for today, I think, is, is an exciting one, and, and I hope that one of the things we'll learn is sort of what does that actually mean? What is genomics translation for public health? And recognizing that it, it's a fairly new, relatively new um, sort of issue in public health, um, although maybe not right, well, we'll hear more about that, we you know what it is. But there's, there's room to sort of create what it is that we want genomics translation to mean for public health. And I think that's something else that we will um, hopefully get to hear about. I think the idea today is to share an understanding of the issues um, in translating genomic research into public health applications and to discuss sort of how those might be addressed. Um, we really want to hear from you. I know that we can't hear your voices, but we would like to hear your questions and comments to the panelists as they go along. I think we will um, you know, so send them as you have them. We'll try to organize them as they come in, and then we'll give an opportunity for the people, for the speakers to address them, both sort of the clarifying questions that you have, but also if there's sort of issues or broader questions that you'd like to um, to hear their comments on, we can we can do that. Um, I'm having a little trouble going on to the next slide, but um, that's. I'd like to um, turn it over right now to Toby Citrin, who is the director of the Center for Public Health and Community Genomics, who will provide a little bit more of an overview and, and give us an idea of where it is that we're going to be going for the rest of the, the session. So thanks, Toby. Right on. Okay, well, it's, uh, let's see, is my slide now showing? Yes. Okay, um, well, good day, everyone. Um, and uh, Jody uh, uh, didn't introduce herself, and I just want to say a word uh, that uh, in addition to her being associate director, assistant director of our Life Sciences Society program at the uh, University of Michigan School of Public Health, she was the uh, founding uh, director of the uh, American Public Health Association Genome Forum. Uh, the three co-sponsors of this webinar are all committed to the effective translation of genomic research into evidence-based applications in clinical practice and public health. They're all participants in the CDC-initiated GAPNET project, about which we're going to hear in a moment. So let me identify these organizational co-sponsors and just say a brief word about the missions. The the Genomics Forum of APHA was formed, of American Public Health Association, was formed in order to provide a place where public health professionals and consumers who are interested in genomics can network and work together pursuing shared objectives. The forum's aim is, uh, in its own words, to assure that the growing influence of genetics and genomics on everyday life in America contributes meaningfully to the public health vision of health for all. And you've got the website 
uh, of the forum uh, in case uh, you would like to become members and are not already. Um, the second co-sponsor uh, who's handling the technology of this webinar uh, is the Genetic Alliance, uh, who, as I think uh, most everyone on this webinar knows, is the largest and well, certainly the most influential national organization advocating on behalf of the consumers of genetic services. Uh, the portion of its mission directly related to the topic of this webinar calls for the Alliance to revolutionize access to information to enable transformation of research into services and individualized decision making. And the third co-sponsor uh, is the center which I direct, the Center for Public Health and Community Genomics, based at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. We are one of two centers that promote the effective integration of genomics into public health practice, the other being based at the University of Washington's School of Public Health. Our center has emphasized in its work the significance of addressing ethical, legal, and social issues relating to genomics and the importance of engaging the community at large in the development and implementation of public health genetics programs. All three of our co-sponsors are participants in the CDC-initiated GAPNET project, uh, whose mission is to accelerate and streamline the translation of genomic research into evidence-based applications in medicine and public health. And Dr. Curry, who follows me on this webinar, will tell us more about this very significant initiative. Now, recognizing the importance of the translation process, uh, if the ever-increasing body of genetic research is going to be translated into effective applications in public health with the ultimate benefit to population health and the reduction of health disparities, the Genomics Forum at APHA has decided to convene a working group on translation. Its mission is going to be to apply the perspective of public health professionals and consumers to the translation process assuring that this process will address public health goals of improving population health and reducing health disparities. This translation working group of the forum will be considered a major stakeholder group in the GAPNET initiative. And its initial organizational meeting is going to be held by telephone conference call on Wednesday, April 21st, from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. And we invite all of you who are on this webinar to join in this working group by entering your contact information on the forum's website shown on this slide. Uh, with that, let me uh, say a very brief word about the uh, two following uh, presenters on this webinar. Uh, Dr. Muin Khoury directs the National Office of Public Health Genomics at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Most of us who are involved in genomics know him as the visionary who has for many years been pointing for all of us the way that genomics can best realize its full potential in promoting the health of the public. Uh, he will be followed by Ms. Deb Duquette, who directs the genomics coord who coordinates the genomics program at the Michigan Department of Community Health. Um, Ms. Duquette is one of the nation's leading public health practitioners who has been integrating genomic applications into the work of public health departments. And she's been sharing her expertise with that community of practitioners nationally at numerous seminars, workshops, institutes, and trainings. And with that, I'll turn this webinar over to Dr. Mouin Khoury. OK. Um, <clears throat> can you all hear me? I'm trying to put my slides on. OK, are my slides up? Yep. OK, this is Moeen Khoury here from uh, Sunny South, um, from the CDC. I'd like to uh, spend about 15 minutes with you to describe to you what this stakeholder-driven collaboration is all about. I'd like to cover three main points. First one is that um, we need uh, urgent data and research, which I call translational research in genomics to realize the, the benefit of genomics for, for health. Uh, the second point is um, the move from research to actual translation has to take into account all the stakeholders' perspectives. And the third point is, in keeping with the first two, 
is the launching of the GAPNAT uh, collaborative uh, to fulfill the promise of genomics. So Toby Citrin has seen uh, this slide many times before. What we have is a major gap, I call it the Grand Canyon, between the initial genome discoveries, which are happening at a faster and faster pace nowadays, and the actual ability to use that information to reduce the burden of disease at the population level. So we have a big gap that we're trying to fill. And many people and many groups have actually pointed to that gap. So many advisory committees, so many, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> you see here on your slide, the SACGHS uh, made reference to this last year, the Presidential Council for Advisors on Science and Technology. I've written about this um, a couple of times. There is another uh, paper in JAMA on closing the evidence gap. So this is nothing new uh, in, in the field of genomics. Uh, the, the issue right now is that the train has already left the station. We can uh, actually buy our own genome online uh, if we have money to spare. And, um, <clears throat> and this has been highlighted, uh, you know, a sort of direct consumer uh, efforts, um, etc. And uh, this points to a workshop we held a uh, couple of years ago about uh, the scientific foundation for uh, direct consumer uh, genomics. Now, forgive me for this busy slide, but uh, this busy slide shows more or less a, uh, a road map for what happens between discoveries and actual reduction of the burden of disease and maps out the actual translation efforts that are being done in this arena, <clears throat> at least for cancer. So most of the research is done for discovery. So for example, the NCI's major budget is in cancer genetics is spent on uh, discovering genes for cancer. Now the next step is figuring out how that those discoveries can lead to a candidate application, like a genetic test or a pharmacogenomic application <clears throat> through the uh, biology work, epidemiology work, uh, early trials, and uh, we have data to show that about 16% of the cancer genetics um, um, uh, resources go into that first step. But then it peters out after that, uh, you know, doing clinical trials or clinical studies that lead to evidence-based recommendations for practice, we call it T2, then implementation research and diffusion and figuring out how to use these things in practice, we call it T3, and then T4 is um, realizing uh, how these things are playing out at the uh, population or the public health level. And all of these T2 to T4 together account for less than 2% of the current expenditure in um, cancer genetic research, and it's uh, the same numbers for other diseases. And what makes it worse is that most of the publications in cancer genetics, at least for one year, were in discovery or early translation, but not about 0.5% were in that P2 uh, domain. So we know that there's not enough data that is being generated to show the promise of genomics uh, beyond discovery. So from translation to research to actual translation requires a lot of the stakeholders coming together. You have technology, industry, the marketing, the oversight, the consumer awareness as represented uh, um, by the Genetic Alliance and many other groups, professional uh, guidelines, clinical practice, the uh, public health, and so on and so forth. And all of these forces, in a way, play um, either for or against to accelerate the translation process throughout a fulcrum, if you will, that is kind of guided by recommendations by uh, evidentiary groups. And we know that there is very little data that's been produced to begin with, so that we don't know much about what's going on except in the discovery arena. And we have these pull and push forces. And if you actually have a very low threshold where you put things into practice very quickly, like this is sort of a status quo, if you will, in the, uh, in the health system here, or short T1, T2, we have very little information on validity and utility of that data. And potentially, no coverage uh, could be both potential for increased harm or benefits. And most of the use is based on expert opinion. This is good for stimulating innovation. But uh, you can see that these other things may, may or may not uh, work for it. Now, on the other hand, if you have a very long incubation period or a short, uh, a long T1, T2, that there could be many valid tests that may not be used in practice. Um, and there could be um, uh, basically a lower incentive for innovation. So we need to find the right balance. And that's what we're all about. I think 
We want to guard against premature translation, i.e. low threshold. And the other thing, we want to guard against the concept of loss trans in translation, which is the high threshold. So what we need is both the knowledge and the wisdom to know the difference and act, act accordingly. Also, the will, the capacity, the policies and resources to act. So this is what GAPNET is all, all about. Um, a few of us last year published this paper in uh, uh, Genetic and Medicine to describe uh, this nascent idea of a collaboration of individuals and organizations that are interested in both validating and translating genome-based applications into practice and prevention. Now, the GAPNET website, as Toby mentioned, is not um, online right now, but will be next week. So please come back, and I will be showing you screenshots from that website and a few others. And too bad you can't really go online today. But what uh, the mission of this organization, or virtual organization right now, is to accelerate and streamline the effective translation of genomic knowledge into practice and public health. We want to empower research and evaluation, dissemination of high quality information, and, and so on. And so we have two major overarching themes for GAPNET. One is empowering research to fill the knowledge gaps. And the second is to link the stakeholders together to information from that research so that we can in, uh, understand where the stakeholders are, are coming from and enhance the evidence-based translation. So here are the two themes superimposed on the translation highway, sort of building the data uh, for translate from translation research and dealing with the stakeholders' forces uh, through a process of what I call stakeholder-driven knowledge synthesis and brokering. And what is knowledge synthesis is essentially an ongoing process of systematic evaluation and evidence synthesis on the health impact of genomic applications as they emerge from research. And the knowledge brokering function is Basically, this organization will facilitate the interactions of the stakeholders. We will try to understand where people are coming from, understand some of the tension uh, that, that could be uh, embedded in uh, the various stakeholders coming together. And together, based on data and information, hopefully the knowledge brokering will find us the right uh, fulcrum or sort of equilibrium in what we try to do. So back in October 2009, we officially launched GAPNET at the University of Ann Arbor in Michigan. And uh, let's see, Toby is somewhere over here. And uh, our other speaker, Deb, is here. And there were uh, more than 100 uh, people that came together uh, during those two days in which um, uh, many working groups were formed. And there was quite a bit of energy. We discussed the four domains of GAPNET that are tied together with this net network of stakeholder groups, uh, knowledge synthesis and dissemination. Uh, the production of evidence-based recommendations, implementation through translation programs, and translation research to fill the gaps. So that's what we're trying to do, essentially, through this um, network of stakeholder groups, is determine and share what we know and what we don't know about any given genomic application at any given point in time, link that with credible and transparent process for evidence uh, development, implement what we know, integrate both in clinical and public health practice through education, policy, surveillance, and evaluation, and then do the research that fill the gaps and also on how to implement these recommendations. So on the GAPNET website, there will be a, a hopefully a growing list of uh, networks and consortia like the Personalized Medicine Coalition, the Genetic Alliance, the APHA Genomics Forum, and others who would have joined uh, in this uh, collaborative. So I'd like to discuss briefly this domain number one and uh, just to tell you that uh, this is going to happen. We have already begun this uh, continuous horizon scanning, uh, and there will be a database launch next week, which will be connected to the website called the GAP KB Finder. And we're going to launch a, um, in, an online journal we call Evidence for Genomic Applications. So this is a screenshot for the GAP Finder. And if you click and search for it, you'll be finding all the new genomic applications that have been added since September 2009. And there's 153 new genomic applications. You see some of them. And this is sort of a non-judgmental um, list with details about the application, the target population, and intended, and intended use. And then through a process of GAPNET-driven enterprise, we're going to have a whole army of people uh, working on uh, through this online database uh, and also journal, so people will get the credit for doing this work, is to uh, have quick reviews of what we know and what we don't know about 
these new applications and then publish these things online. And uh, this is going to be using the Google Knoll platform. There is a board of editors. We call them expert moderators. And just to give you an idea, and there will be many more, this is sort of one genomic application, the CYP2D6 testing to predict response to tamoxifen in women with breast cancer. This will be a quick uh, review of the literature and how, whether or not recommendations have been done, sort of the evidence overview. And, um, and this, many of those hopefully will be added in the next few years as people do their work. And we would love to connect this effort with GAPNET domain number two, which is turning this over to evidentiary bodies like the uh, EGAP working group, which is an independent panel that reviews the evidence. And um, uh, EGAP working group has been working for more than five years now. And uh, they have produced a number of recommendations that have been published in genetics and medicine. We would like to build on the EGAP initiative, make it more nimble, more uh, uh, quicker in, in scope, and link with other efforts in the U.S. and elsewhere. And then we, uh, the domain number three for GAPNET is the translation programs uh, on candidate and validated applications. Currently, CDC, NIH, AHRQ, and HRSA, and others do fund many of these programs. Some of them are clinical, some of them are public health, and would like to uh, connect all of these programs together, as, as I'll show you in a minute. And finally, the translation research uh, effort is to fill the gaps in our knowledge. Again, lots of research is being funded, especially by NIH, HRQ, and CDC, and this new rubric of comparative effectiveness research, which I don't have time to uh, uh, define for this audience. So uh, you will see next week on the GAPNET website that we will have the active genomics translation programs uh, clickable. And we've, uh, so for example, here we clicked on uh, Pennsylvania, and you see all these four projects. We currently fund five of these. Uh, NCI has about 20 plus projects, HRQ a few, and we would like to connect people to data, to databases. And in a way, this is sort of the current structure of what GAPNET is all about. We have a planning group uh, that's been meeting regularly since the uh, another meeting. The stakeholder organizations that I mentioned earlier, the projects that are connected, and seven working groups have emerged, the four pillars of GAPNET, plus family history as a special interest group, communication, the partners and policies. So what all these groups will be doing as we move forward, they will be looking at the data. The data will be in online knowledge bases on genomic applications, evidence recommendations, translation research and projects, and there will be online connectivity of these various working groups through um, this uh, website that was created spe specifically for that purpose to facilitate dialogue. And so in a way, what GAPNET is trying to do is put stakeholders in the same room or in the same space, virtual or otherwise, and then connecting them to the, to the data. So I'd like to end up my talk with uh, going back to uh, what GAPNET is all about, trying to build the data from translation research, empower that research, then connect the stakeholders to that research, dealing with the tensions and the forces, and then uh, hopefully lead to more evidence-based translation and acceleration of genomics to improve population health. So thank you very much, and I'd like to turn it back to, uh, I think Deb is next. That's right. As we're getting set up and sort of transferring over to Deb, just thanks, Colleen. It was great. Can you see my screen? Yes, yep. I can. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Deb Duquette, and as Toby mentioned, I am the genomics coordinator at the Michigan Department of Community Health. And the Michigan Department of Community Health has been quite fortunate to receive cooperative agree of agreements from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention National Office of Public Health Genomics. The first um, cooperative agreement was a five-year cooperative agreement from 2003 to 2008 with the goal of integrating genomics into chronic disease programs. Our current cooperative agreement is from 2008 to 2011 with the goal of translating evidence-based recommendations for cancer genomics 
to promote best practices through surveillance, education, and policy change. I have served as the project manager for both of these cooperative agreements and also manage the Michigan Sudden Cardiac Death of the Young Surveillance Program. I'd like to extend a special thank you to the Genetic Alliance, the APHA Genomics Forum, University of Michigan Center for Public Health and Community Genomics, and CDC's National Office of Public Health Genomics for inviting me to speak today. As discussed by Toby and Muin, um, the GAPNET mission, I've been asked to address that mission from the viewpoint of public health practice and to address two key areas, which are, number one, the promise of genomics for public health practice, and number two, how we can overcome barriers to translating research into public health applications. I'll try my best to provide some ideas for both of these areas, but please note that this presentation is meant to initiate your thoughts and questions, and my ultimate hope is that this encourages you to become involved in GAPNET and the APHA's Genomics Forum's new translation working group. If you have any questions following today's webinar, please do not hesitate to contact me at the phone number or email listed on the bottom of this slide. The promise that genomics holds for public health practice is immense. Five ways that genomics enhances public health practice are highlighted on this slide. Um, first, genomics discoveries provide insights into the etiologies of many chronic diseases with genetic susceptibilities, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, and asthma, to name a few. Secondly, knowledge of one's own family health history and genomics risk is a motivator for some to adopt healthy behaviors and increase recommended health screening. Third, I believe that adopting healthy behaviors to reduce genomic risks are best supported by the entire family in a genomics framework, with affected family members being supported to reduce their risks by other family members, and the other family members adopting healthy risk-reducing behaviors, becoming a model for future generations to come. Fourth, at the Michigan Department of Community Health, we have also found that genomics is a cross-cutting topic that encompasses many public health disciplines across the entire lifespan. Finally, and most importantly, as conveyed in the GAPNET vision, the ultimate promise of genomics for public health practice is to reduce early mortality related to common chronic diseases through the appropriate use of genomic technologies and tools providing targeted interventions to those high-risk populations, and personalizing screening, diagnosis, and treatment based on genomic risk. At the end of today's webinar, um, a survey will be provided to participants. And for that survey, this question will be asked that I'd like you to think about as for the remaining of this presentation. Um, what do you think is the greatest barrier to genomics translation for public health practice? A, lack of time, staff, and funding. B, lack of genomic competency. C, lack of interest in genomics relevance. D, lack of evidence that genomics improves health outcomes. Despite the promise that genomics holds for public health practice, the challenges to integrating genomics are many. In Michigan, in the past year alone, our state has been tremendously affected by the economy which this has led to state employees receiving mandated furlough days and bank leave time, and to state programs being significantly reduced due to state budget cuts. So how can public health staff be asked to add more, including such a new and evolving topic such as genomics, to their overpacked work plans and workloads? I therefore believe that the greatest barrier to translation of genomics into public health practice is lack of funding. Although a small number of states have been successful in using state funds to create and sustain their genomics program, most states would only be able to build a genomics program with federal funds. Unfortunately, in 2008, with the loss of federal funds, two exceptional state genomic programs, Utah and Minnesota, were not able to be sustained. Additional barriers include the lack of population-based genomic data, lack of genomic competency and literacy among most professionals in the public, and lack of evidence that genomic applications lead to improved health outcomes. Other barriers, although not unique to genomics, include competing public health priorities, staying abreast of discoveries, assuring access to services and technologies, health disparities, and reimbursement for services. 
In consideration of these many challenges, I'd like to highlight some effective strategies to assist interested public health practitioners to overcome some of these barriers, which is in sum to integrate, enhance, and network. The first strategy that I'd like to discuss is integrating genomics into already existing successful programs. For example, as was done this year at the federal level, integrating genomics into long-lasting objectives is vital for successful translation of genomics. As you may know, for the first time, the new 10-year national objectives called Healthy People 2020 includes two genomics objectives, which are to increase the proportion of women who have a family history of breast and or ovarian cancer who receive genetic counseling, and to increase the proportion of individuals newly diagnosed with colorectal cancer who received genetic testing to identify Lynch syndrome. A similar strategy can be done at the state level. In 2009, in Michigan, a genomics goal to increase the availability of cancer-related genomic information to the Michigan public and decrease barriers to risk-appropriate services was added to our Comprehensive Cancer Control Plan for 2009 to 2015. Genomics is now one of the 13 goals identified in the Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Control Plan. Importantly, this genomics goal included three genomics implementation objectives and numerous strategies to accomplish these objectives. The Michigan, cancer, the Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Control Plan is created by the Michigan Cancer Consortium, which is an organization of over 120 organizations. These 120 organizations identified and agreed to accomplish a handful of implementation objectives by 2011. We were pleasantly surprised to learn that one of the three genomics implementation objectives was chosen, which is to expand public knowledge about the impact of genetics on cancer risk and management. Because of this, the Michigan Cancer Consortium and the Michigan chapter of the American Cancer Society have created, compiled, and disseminated a tremendous amount of cancer genomic resources for the public, including a family history website, public service announcements, radio interviews, and posters. All of these resources can be accessed at the following website. It is through such networks and collaborations with pooling of resources, staff, and time that translation of genomics into public health can be accomplished. A second strategy to consider is to build upon existing resources. With the barriers of limited time, staff, funds, and genomic competency, it would be difficult and ineffective to create new resources, especially when resources already exist. I'll discuss a few examples of resources that I found to be quite helpful and have been well received by end users. Please note that you are more than welcome to use, adapt, or recycle any of the resources that are presented from Michigan. The U.S. Surgeon General Tool for Family Health History, which encourages collection and documentation of family history and sharing with others, is a great way to spark interest and easily demonstrate the relevance of genomics in public health. However, as was conveyed in last summer's Family History and Improving Health Conference, please note that the evidence base supporting the importance of family history for chronic disease prevention is weak, which is likely related to family history being long recognized as a key element in clinical care, even predating evidence-based medicine. Documenting the impact of family history of chronic diseases to improve health outcomes, I believe, will be most effective in public health practice, especially in settings where health disparities exist. Demonstrating the cross-cutting nature of genomics and family health history across many public health disciplines is the Michigan Department of Community Health Family History and Your Health Newsletters. These newsletters were started in November 2004 because of the first National Family History Day. Sixteen issues have been created and disseminated on a wide variety of topics, including cancer, kidney disease, obesity, asthma, osteoporosis, diabetes, and gene environmental interactions. These newsletters have been well received and have expanded the reach to others beyond even their targeted audience. With the same theme of successful translation of genomics into public health practice by using existing infrastructure, programs, and resources, the next way to overcome a barrier to genomics translation is to look at existing public health data through a genomics lens. In Michigan, I believe that this is a vital part to our su success and sustainability. For instance, we have been using death certificate and cancer registry data to conduct surveillance on potential cases of genomic risk. Every year since 2004, we have also added family history and genomic-related phone survey questions to the Michigan Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. 
The next four slides will provide an example of how existing data sources and surveys can be used in genomics translation using a specific example, sudden cardiac death of the young. Because sudden cardiac death of the young is variably defined, I'd first like to clarify how we have decided to define this unexpected and tragic cause of death. We have defined sudden cardiac death of the young as a death occurring out of the hospital, including in the emergency room, to an individual between 1 and 39 years of age, with an underlying cause of death reported as a cardiac disease or unexplained cause. The early age of these deaths is important from a genomic standpoint since these early deaths are more likely to have a genetic contribution and thereby place immediate family members at significantly increased risk. We have reviewed death certificates from 1999 to 2006 and found 2,336 deaths matching our definition of sudden cardiac death of the young for the underlying cause of death. From death certificates alone, we know that most of these deaths have occurred in black males with an age-adjusted rate of 15.8 per 100,000 compared to a statewide rate of 5.5 per 100,000. We also know that almost half of these deaths happen to those 35 to 39 years of age and that over three-quarters have been autopsied. The underlying cause of death in 37 percent of these cases was reported by the medical examiner to be atherosclerosis. This was quite surprising to us since other countries and continents such as Italy and Australia, have found other conditions as a leading cause of sudden cardiac death in the young, specifically arrhythmi arrhythmiogenic right ventricular dysplasia in Italy and unexplained death in Australia. However, this may be reflective of our nation's different behaviors and lifestyles leading to earlier onset atherosclerosis. Of note, when we look at the underlying causes of death for those 1 to 29 years of age, only 9% are related to atherosclerosis and 20% are related to cardiomyopathy. Using the Michigan Behavioral Risk Factor Survey, in 2007, 2,856 Michigan adults were asked two questions. One, how many of your biological family members have had a sudden cardiac death or sudden unexplained death between the ages of 1 and 39, and what was the relationship to you? As is shown, 6.3% of respondents replied that they had a family history of sudden cardiac death in at least one of their family members. Furthermore, 35% of these young family members were an immediate relative, and the most commonly reported family member was a sibling. Additionally, 26% of respondents had two or more family members die of sudden cardiac death at a young age. Due to the early onset, close relationship, and multiple affected family members, these respondents would be at a significant genomic risk. Furthermore, reflective of the mortality data presented on the last slide, significant health disparities were also found. 11.2% of respondents who self-reported as black non-Hispanic stated that they had at least one family member who had died of sudden cardiac death in the young. Rates were also higher for respondents with lower household income and less education. We also examined the prevalence of selected health care, health status, chronic and chronic conditions, and behaviors among those with and without a family history of sudden cardiac death. As is shown, among those with family history, 23% had Medicaid insurance compared with 10% among those without a family history. In addition to higher Medicaid usage, those with a family history also had a significantly higher proportion who had ever been diagnosed with high blood pressure and a higher proportion who were current smokers compared to those without a family history. If you would like to see other behavioral risk factor surveys used by Michigan and other states, please visit the listed website on the bottom of the slide. I hope that this quick overview of ways to use existing data sources and surveys has helped to show how genomics can begin to identify and address demonstrated health disparities with the potential for screening and designing evidence-based interventions to reach those at greatest risk. If you would like to learn more or are looking for ways to stay abreast of current genomic developments, I would encourage you to consider signing up to receive the weekly update from the National Office of Public Health Genomics, which is posted each Thursday and provides a wonderful list of recent news items and journal articles related to genomics. Also, the upcoming Summer Institute in Seattle is being held June 14th to 18th, and this year has an exciting lineup of speakers and topics, including health economics and public health, epigenetics, and genomic literacy. 
and the fourth National Public Health Genomics Conference is being held December 8th to 10th in Bethesda and will highlight best practices in public health genomics and preparing for the future. Lastly, I'd encourage all of you to consider becoming a member of GAPNET and the APHA Genomics Forum's Translation Workgroup. For public health professionals, I think GAPNET will be the mechanism to network, identify current genomic needs in public health practice, and develop ways to fill these gaps. I also believe that GAPNET creates an opportunity to share successes and, learn, and lessons learned with others interested in effective translation of validated genomics information from multiple disciplines, including public health practice. I'd like to end this presentation with this quote from Henry Ford, which I think encompasses the practice of the promise of GAPNET to accomplish its mission. And I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. Thanks. Um, thanks, Deb. So we do have a few questions um, that have come in. I would like you to um, feel free to um, you know, send. I guess you do it over the chat mechanism um, to, uh, if you have other questions. I know that this is a fair amount of, um, I did receive one comment that this is a lot of material, and it is. And even if the questions are not, um, so any questions are fair game is what I'd like to say. That it is, it is a lot of material, and I think it's, um, I think it's exciting material. So um, uh, go ahead and send out your questions. If we want to pull up, can we pull up my screen again? I have some of the questions written out. Um, some of, one of them is sort of pretty straightforward, sort of how do you get, if you wanted to, so the um, sort of technical logistical questions. One is if you want to see the presentations and have a copy of the PowerPoints that we just got from Dr. Corey and um, Deb Duquette, those are available on the Genetic Alliance um, website. We will probably be able to post them to the Genomics Forum website as well. Um, and in a few, as soon as we get my screen up again, you'll see the website for that. Um, there's also going to be, Toby, help me. If the, um, somebody also asked about the, um, okay, the, um, yeah, no. Uh, website. Yeah, I, I, uh, I know, omitted the uh, the URL for that. Um, okay. But starting, is that what the question was? Yeah, so they want to access the GAPNET translation. Can folks see my screen? How can we access the GAPNET yeah. translation research and program map on Dr. Corey's slides? And that would be on yeah, the the, the the GAPNET website that Dr. Corey described. Um, will be available to the public starting next week, Wednesday. And okay. the URL for that will be simply www.gapnet.org. So starting next Wednesday, uh, not only the map, but a whole variety of materials on GAPNET, as well as ways to get involved in GAPNET, uh, will be available at that website. Um, great. So um, I guess one question for everybody, um, for the speakers and Toby as well, sort of, and um, what do you see as the unique role of the Genomics Forum Working Group amongst the other GAPNET stakeholders group? I'll, well, I could, I could say a word about that. Others may want okay. to join in. I, uh, I, I, I just said a, a very a um, few words about it in, in my uh, intro. Um, the, um, if you recall, the, the mission of GAPNET uh, is this uh, streamlining and accelerating of translation of genomic research into evidence-based applications uh, in uh, clinical practice or medicine and public health. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it's very essential that there be a push and a pull aspect of translation. The push aspect is people who are doing research, finding out possible uses of what comes out of the research, and then disseminating those, hoping that they'll be picked up and used. The pull aspect of it is people who are right now engaged in promoting public health, uh, in reducing health disparities, 
preventing disease, the whole public health workforce broadly conceived, um, trying to come together in order to assure that the translation process serves the needs of public health practice. And it seems to me that the translation work group uh, in the APHA forum, that its main mission needs to be to assure that this translation process is, in fact, serving the needs of public health and the mission of public health, because the people who make up the forum are for the most part, people engaged in public health practice uh, or academe uh, serving the mission of public health. There are a number of ways that uh, their voices coming together can then translate into the agenda of GAFNET, into funding decisions, uh, into where emphasis is placed on moving genetic research into that final T4 uh, slot that Dr. Gurry spoke of, serving the interests and needs of public health, um, pulling against this uh, translation process, making sure it serves that mission. Great. Molina, are you still on the phone? I'm, I'm still here. I'm, I'm looking at the next question about the National Coordinating Center and the regional collaboratives. Uh, so far, uh, not in a very active way, but they will be. So the, the answer is uh, stay tuned. We are in, uh, in dialogue. And many of you, I mean, the, the public health community, at least the, the states and the genetics uh, uh, practitioners are part of these collaboratives. So we, we, we don't have a formal uh, sort of organization to organization uh, type arrangement. I mean, GAFNET is very much evolving as we speak. Uh, it was an idea. And I think the, the community, the stakeholders, can take it any way they want. And that's, that's obviously a good way to go. Okay. Um, right, this is, um, here's another question that I would probably go to both um, Deb and Moeen and Toby. Um, interested by the idea that public health genomics is a cross-cutting topic across many public health disciplines. How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I can take that on uh, if, sure. if, if it's okay with the other two. I mean, um, from the beginning, genomics, uh, <clears throat> at least in a public health environment, uh, we viewed it as so cross-cutting that it involves all the programs within public health, including environmental health. And um, the, uh, so the, the whole notion that there are gene-environment interactions underlying uh, the causes of human disease and why pe some people get sick and others not, and how you use biomarkers to track progress. So I think um, in environmental health, in asthma, in uh, many other conditions, uh, whatever public health interventions are being uh, conducted uh, to ameliorate the, uh, uh, the impact of environmental exposures, I mean, one of the things we can do is track the progress of these things to see whether or not subgroups of the population may be uh, more susceptible than others or could be helped more or could, we could drive policies on the basis of uh, maybe the most sensitive uh, fraction of the population on the basis of exposures. A lot of research is obviously going on in gene-environment interaction and I think the, the applications haven't quite matured yet, but there is, uh, I think, stay tuned, there is more to be implemented. I mean, our office has funded a number of these projects within CDC and on public health. And I think in Michigan, you all are doing uh, a few of those, if you want to comment on this. Deb. Um, sure. Um, I, what, when, I, when I read that question, um, I think actually within environmental health is where one of actually our biggest successes is, and I didn't actually present about that, so I do apologize for not talking about that a bit more. But we have, um, as um, you mean with stating asthma and gene environmental interactions would be one of our um, most important programs, I believe, to highlight. Within our environmental health epidemiology program, it's a pro project which is called Healthy Homes University, where they go into households um, to try to reduce asthma triggers, but they also do look um, at uh, air quality issues and lead issues. And we've been quite, quite successful in actually integrating genomics into that project and really looking at um, important factors such as family history 
history and not only um, educating about the individual with asthma in the family, but also talking about how risk reduction for that individual with asthma really can help all the other family members, including those that may have um, a higher risk because of their family history. If people would like to know more about that Healthy Homes University project, please once again feel free to contact me after today's um, webinar, and I would be more than help, happy to actually give you quite a bit of information about that. And if I could add a footnote here, um, Ms. Toby, the, um, in the schools of public health, certainly if our school is an example in Michigan, um, the departments of environmental health sciences have been increasingly uh, bringing in expertise on genomics uh, on their faculties and, and uh, doing research and teaching on gene environment interaction. And it seems to me the opportunity here is for the schools to have a closer connection with the world of practice so that some of what is going on in a very exciting way in schools of public health can be translated into the work of health departments in the environmental health area. This, I hope, will be on the agenda of the translation working group in the APHA forum since both academics and practitioners uh, are members of the forum and hopefully will join in that working group. Okay. Jody, do you want me to take on the next one? What do you sure, see as the role for industry? Question. Yeah, and there's another sort of similar question um, also. Oh, genetic counselor, the first one. So, so I haven't read that one. Take those two together. So, well, why don't you go for the role of industry and you can... Yeah, okay, so I, I read the first one first. The, uh, okay. Industry is a major partner and stakeholder to the GAPNET enterprise. I mean, without industry, we won't have tests. We won't have uh, things to buy. And, you know, many of us in public health sometimes view them as sort of the bad guys. But really, they, uh, I mean, there is a major role for, uh, for them uh, to play. I mean, we have to recognize the, the push and pull forces, as I said earlier. Uh, to me, I mean, even in that GAPNET meeting we had in Michigan, we had several members of industry, and we had DECODE, we had 23andMe, we had other groups uh, who are selling these products on the street. And, you, you know, by, by airing out the actual evidence on applications and informing and educating the providers and the researchers and the, and the consumers and the policymakers, I think we can have a very savvy uh, enterprise that essentially uses the best that there is to offer in genomics and then throws out the rest, uh, whether it's recreation or otherwise. Uh, I mean, there is uh, plenty you can do uh, in, in, in that arena. So trying to figure out what, what works and what doesn't work is a shared goal between industry, public health, and, and academe. Uh, so we welcome that uh, collaboration. With them. Now, we've, uh, in terms of differentiating what works and what doesn't work, only science can tell us. And there's been, and then by highlighting that science, um, I think um, uh, the public will be much better served. Thank you. So, I, and the other is more of a comment. Maybe Debbie can react to it if you'd like. But as a genetic counselor working in the context of industry and talking to people, who have undergone a SNP panel to assess risk for common risk. I'm convinced that this counseling and risk assessment is making a difference for many people. It only touches a certain number due to cost, but many members I speak to were offered the screen by their employer at a significant discount, and in some cases it was free to the employee, totally supplemented by the employer, which I think is a fantastic model, making this available to those who otherwise could not afford it. Um, I forgot to mention that actually um, my training is as a genetic counselor, and I was actually um, a genetic counselor in clinical practice, mostly reproductive genetics, um, for approximately 12 years before I came over to the state public health program. And um, I haven't had so much experience in public health with working with people that have had um, the SNP testing, but I think it has a nice parallel with family history and family history being able to identify risks that also can do wonders, I think, for some families and make a very big difference and um, pr provide motivation to change behaviors. But I was quite interested to see in this comment about um, employers also offering such testing, and um, I'd really like to learn more about that. So whoever provided that comment, if you can send me an email afterwards, I would really um, um, like to learn more about what this comment was about, because that sounds quite interesting. Okay. 
And Jody, can I pick up on uh, Deb here about the assertion that it is making a difference with a capital I and the capital S? Okay, this uh, this is a testable hypothesis. Um, if you deploy this information to hundreds and hundreds of people, and uh, some people will be will benefit from this information, some people could be hurt by it. So I think anecdotal information has to be. Uh, supported by either clinical trials or observational studies, not just on the basis of one person uh, said that I benefited from that information. It could be a placebo effect. It could be any number of things. Some uh, the, the information that is provided by these panels changes day by day, and I've known of some people who have taken irreversible lifetime decisions on the basis of their SNP profile. So, some of it could be good, some of it could be bad, some of it could lead to uh, cascade health effects and unnecessary health expenses. So I would love to hear more about uh, what the genetic counselors is saying about is making a difference and what kind of data that supports that beyond the anecdotes of one person who used that test and said this saved my life because I, I think we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Moeen, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the new healthcare reform legislation as I heard, uh, mandates that the basic insurance plans that um, are going to be available to everybody uh, under, the, under the new legislation must cover those preventive services that have been anointed by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force so that a stepwise uh, process leading to coverage of these genomic services would be to do the kind of testing that you just spoke of in order to prove uh, the uh, outcomes that result, have them adopted by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and then automatically they will be covered by insurance throughout the country. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a whole, uh, I mean, yes, Toby, I don't know how healthcare reform will be implemented, but we're beginning on that road. And I think evidence-based medicine will have a larger pl uh, place in that uh, arena of uh, implementation. And EGAP was built on the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force model. It's just that the uh, task force wasn't taking enough genomic topics. That's why we created the EGAP, but we work close. I mean, they work hand-in-hand hand with them. So, yes, the idea is finding what the genomic applications are, doing the research that shows uh, the benefit, the, uh, the balance of benefits versus harms, do the evidence evaluations and, and move them into practice as quickly as possible. Some people argue that, well, this will take time and, you know, so many lives can be saved in the meantime. And uh, so can we wait for clinical trials to be done? And I, the answer is it depends on what the context is and what the applications are. So, but in general, I think uh, genomics shouldn't be treated as any differently from any other, um, you know, um, area in medicine or public health that you have to build an evidentiary uh, base uh, to move it into practice. And the sooner we do that, the more we can fulfill the promise of genomics in, uh, in population health. Absolutely. So I think the last two questions, there's two more questions, and then we'll probably, um, Toby will wrap us up. But um, so the questions have to do with what else is, you know, sort of the streamlining yeah. question of, 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 you know, coordinating efforts across agencies and then across the world. So how do, you know, how is it being um, coordinated? Yeah, I can take on both questions, and uh, if you want, and Toby and Deb can complement that. So internationally, we have, uh, there is a vibrant public health genomics movement and a similar network around the world, which is called GraphInt, Genome Research Applications for Population Health International Network, and the U.S. is one of uh, many networks uh, around uh, uh, Europe, South America, GraphInt. You can, there is a website, graphint.org. Uh, you can look at to see how countries have come together uh, to, uh, to do this, both from developing and developed uh, countries. We have active uh, discussions with the WHO. We had a meeting with them, and there will be another uh, international meeting probably in 2011 on genomics and global health uh, to try to uh, bring in a, uh, a global agenda into perspective, especially around uh, developing countries where uh, we didn't talk much about the burden of infectious disease here, but there is a, a large role to play in uh, genomics and uh, the control of infectious disease. Now, as far as the uh, harmonization and streamlining between federal agencies, we uh, were all obviously uh, talking a lot 
uh, with our partners in FDA and NIH and HRSA and HRQ. I personally spend two days a week in Bethesda at the NIH, and uh, there are uh, all these working groups, GAPNET, um, uh, the uh, steering committee is formed uh, of several government uh, agencies. We all sit together also at the uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee on Genetic Health and Society. So there is quite a bit of um, uh, interaction. Uh, can we do more collaboration? I think the answer is yes. And I'm hoping that the GAPNET stakeholders and uh, the working group can, by, you know, by interacting and showing this common agenda for the feds to get together, I think we can uh, dupl um, you know, unduplicate our efforts and, and use the resources more effectively, but um, uh, you know, we'd love to do more in this uh, space. Great. All right. Um, so I think this has been a fabulous sort of start, and I think that the working group hopefully can pick up on some of these threads that have um, um, come risen to the top as a result of this discussion. Toby, would you like to um, sort of wrap up and remind us sort of where we should be in two weeks? Just, uh, just uh, for people to, uh, to, to know, uh, again, the uh, two ways in which uh, this conversation can be translated into working with uh, all of us uh, in promoting translation into evidence-based applications. Uh, one is to go on the new website starting next Wednesday, www.gapnet.org, where you will be able to access so much of the information we've been talking about here, as well as registering as either someone looking in on GAPNET or someone participating actively in its work, and also joining in the translation working group of the APHA Genomics Forum, which is going to have its first an organizational meeting on April 21st at noon, and you can sign in for that group uh, at the uh, either by emailing Nicole Exe at the email shown here or on the website of the Genomics Forum. And we hope that uh, everyone who's been participating in this webinar will uh, carry out either one or both of those uh, actions in order to be part of this process that we've been talking about uh, in this webinar. Thanks to everyone for your participation. Thank you.